I sat down, took out some sheets of paper, and began with the first thing that occurred to me, without knowing what would follow, without any sort of plan. My characters will go about constructing themselves according to how they act and speak, above all, how they speak. Their personalities will form little by little, and sometimes their personality will be that of not having one. Miguel de Unamuno, Niebla. Hello again, and welcome back. Let's continue analyzing Cervantes' masterpiece. Chapter 60 relates the amazing encounter with Roque Guinart, a bandolero of Catalonia based on a real historical figure. The episode is a political allegory about justice, offering a contrast between high imperialism and its lower alternatives. As we shall see, the latter include anarchy, crime syndicates, and republicanism in its crudest form, in other words, factions. Don Quixote begins by making sure not to go anywhere near Zaragoza, finding out first which was the most direct road to Barcelona without going near Zaragoza. Recall that Zaragoza is named after Augustus Caesar. Six days later, our heroes spend the night among oak or cork trees, an odd vacillation between sublime and base trees, which the narrator ominously attributes to Cide Amete's uncertainty. Don Quixote meditates on the three appearances of Dulcinea in part two in the cave of Montesinos outside El Toboso and at the Duke and Duchess's estate in the company of Merlin. Finally, Don Quixote decides to assault his squire one last time. Note the imperial anecdote that he cites, which includes the origin of the motto of the Catholic kings of Spain. If Alexander the Great cut the Gordian knot, saying it's all the same whether to cut or untie, and for that he did not cease to be the universal lord of all Asia, then the exact same thing could happen now in the disenchantment of Dulcinea should I lash Sancho against his will. Politically speaking, Don Quixote appeals to empire in order to justify his abuse of the domestic population. When Don Quixote unties Sancho's belt, the squire awakes and rebels. First, he objects on legal grounds. The lashes to which I obligated myself have to be voluntary and not by force. Then he reacts physically. Giving him a kick, he threw him to the ground face up. Did you know the bandolero rock in art represents the dark side of the small nobility of Catalonia? who use such criminals to terrorize the peasantry and thus maintain their own power. He is based on Parrot Rocaguinarda, 1582-1635. Recall the description of Sancho as having long shanks in Chapter 9 of Part 1. Sancho presses his knee into Don Quixote's chest and pins his arms to the ground. It's a major turning point. Sancho breaks the organic bonds of feudalism right here. Don Quixote is shocked for the second time in two chapters. How now, traitor? How dare you raise your hand against your natural lord and master? Sancho justifies his actions using complex and ironical allusions to the first civil war of Castile between Pedro I, allied with the townships and the Jews, and Enrique II, supported by the nobles. Curiously, he quotes the supporters of Enrique II. I remove no king, I install no king. Rather, I'm helping myself, for I'm my own lord. Stranger still, he then identifies with a female character in a popular ballad. Here you will die, traitor, enemy of Doña Sancha. Don Quixote relents and promises not to touch Sancho again. Like the Fulling Mills episode in part one, there's something homoerotic going on here. More importantly, the stage is set for the political problem of Roque's bandits. The encounter with Roque begins when Sancho hits his head on the feet of bodies that are hanging from nearby trees. Don Quixote explains that men have been hanged according to the brutal justice of bandits, and so they must be near Barcelona, famous at that time for its factionalism. Suddenly, our heroes are surrounded by more than 40 of Roque's bandits, all speaking Catalan. They are particularly interested in the belt and saddlebags of Sancho's ass. Sancho worries about the gold escudos given to him by the Duke. 
Fortunately for Sancho, Roque arrives. He's about 34 years old of dark complexion and carries four pocket pistols or short blunderbusses, a small shotgun popularized by Catalan bandits. Quixotic mission. How does Sancho react when Don Quixote tries to pull down his pants? A, he kisses him. B, he cries. C, he resists. Correct answer, C, he resists. The specificity of guns is thematic in this episode. There's also a double social conflict here. Roque euphemistically tells his squires to leave Sancho alone, and he tells Don Quixote, who is melancholic and defeated, not to worry, claiming that he is not cruel like Osiris. This is a contradiction because Roque alludes to the cruel Egyptian king, Bucyrus. Either way, Don Quixote represents a Castilian Hercules who avenged the death of Osiris, but killed Bucyrus. Roque again consoles Don Quixote. The heavens, by strange and unseen ways never imagined by mankind, frequently elevate the fallen and enrich the poor. Note the role reversal here, with the bandit playing the role of the Virgilian or Christian liberator and Don Quixote that of the captive. That's all for now. Join me next time as we continue interpreting the most important literary masterpiece in the Spanish language. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.